Well, good evening, everyone. Uh, thank you very much for uh, coming out on uh, a night like tonight. Uh, uh, this is the uh, first uh, talk of uh, 2023. Uh, sometimes, you know, when you're here, uh, I really like the idea of being able to see people. For two years, I've been going upstairs to my upstairs bedroom, talking to my computer for an hour, an hour and a half. It's not nearly the same thing. And yet tonight when I got out of the car, you know, there's a lot to be said for staying at home, talking to your computer. So my name is Park Davis. And uh, I guess my mic is now on or maybe it's not. Who knows? Uh, we're doing an experiment tonight. And as you can tell, not all experiments always work perfectly the first time. So... Uh, we're face to face, but we're also trying to stream simultaneously out on YouTube. And uh, we're having some difficulties in doing that. I'm, we may or may not be online right now, but uh, at least all you people that have braved the weather, you're gonna hear me and you're gonna hear uh, Eric in a few minutes too. Uh, we're still learning how to make it all work seamlessly, obviously. Uh, so thanks for being part of this experiment. Uh, the talks were started, these sorts of things, uh, about 16 years ago. And uh, I guess, uh, mea culpa, I was the one that started. I was a uh, PR director way back when. And so, uh, uh, but I didn't move quickly enough. I'm still here. And uh, so I'm still here talking about these. Uh, the ideas were to get people together in the winter uh, to uh, at least remember sailing, what it should be like instead of what you look outside and see tonight, and also to raise some money for uh, uh, youth sailing uh, through, the, uh, Tooney, through uh, uh, the Legacy Fund. So uh, we did call them Tooney Talks back 15, 16 years ago, but of course we've got so much better since then, and uh, well, you heard today inflation, well everything's got a bit more expensive, so uh, tonight we're still looking for donations and uh, uh, we're looking for maybe the cost of a beer, something like that. So I'm going to cue Jim here and he's going to uh, uh, do a quick uh, circuit of the room to uh, do a collection. And uh, for all you on YouTube, and I'm not sure if anybody's on YouTube yet. Oh, everybody's on YouTube, that's great. So uh, you can consider uh, donating uh, through Eventbrite uh, just like it's outlined in your uh, invitation. Um, I understand that, uh, according to Tony, uh, uh, we already have over uh, 50 bucks uh, donated through Eventbrite that way. So in terms of a schedule, uh, this is the first one of 12 talks. Uh, they're going to be every Wednesday night at 7.30. They're going to be scheduled here in the club. And... Uh, I promise we'll get better as time goes on. Uh, we'll be out on uh, YouTube as well. Uh, the actual topics of each talk are going to be on the website. You can have a look at that and see what they are. And uh, they're open to everybody, uh, people, not only in various clubs on both sides of the river, but now that it's on YouTube, anybody, period. Now, be aware that they're going to be videotaped or videoed, whatever, and kept on YouTube. So if you told your boss you're at work, you might possibly be also on YouTube and uh, kept for posterity. So uh, be aware of that. So, or, yeah, okay. You went sailing, yeah. In terms of introductions, uh, there's two different groups working on this. Uh, one is a foreground group. Uh, that uh, sort of takes care of the public parts of it and also an AV group. And uh, so I'll just list the names of some of the people in the two groups. Uh, Tony Wright, uh, Stephen Kidd, who's back here, uh, Mark Edwards, who's here, uh, Ron Evans, uh, he does the uh, YouTube, and uh, Mark Rand, who's back here someplace too. So uh, as well as that, Sean, Batten is here uh, tonight. He's the NSC sailing manager. And uh, 
we basically got him moonlighting tonight uh, as director and producer of uh, the very first uh, edition of this streaming show. You already know me, I'm Park Davis. So all the speakers and uh, the organizers, they're all volunteers. Uh, we run on volunteers, really. So if you have any stories to share, if you want to go into showbiz and maybe take my job, that would be fine. You could be here in place of me, and that would be great. Uh, if you want to help out in the speakers program in any way, uh, just come and uh, either talk to me afterwards, or you can email at uh, winterspeaker, one word, winterspeaker at nsc.ca. So just a note about next week, uh, on Wednesday, the February 1st, Brian Legro is going to be here and he's going to be talking about his voyage. And I say the word voyage, it's not just a trip, it's a voyage because he went uh, cruising from Newfoundland up the Labrador coast and then over and ended up in Iceland. So uh, I guess it was cold weather sailing in the summer. But uh, in any case, Brian here is the skipper of Loon. It's a Sabre sailboat on W Dock. And uh, he's uh, been here at uh, NSC for a number of years. So he'll be here next week to talk. Uh, tonight's presentation. Uh, for those people that are watching on YouTube, uh, you can use the chat function now uh, to uh, uh, set up any questions that you have. We'll deal with those at the end after uh, the speakers uh, finish speaking. And uh, we'll get to them at that point. Uh, the speaker tonight is uh, Eric Fleury. He's a past member of NSC, and he's now over at uh, CBRG, CVGR in Elmer. Uh, he started sailing at uh, age of 12 on his father's Nonsuch 30, and he's owned... Uh, both the Tanzer 7.5, and he now has Prince Igor on Ontario 32. So Eric is a uh, ABYC certified marine electrical technician, and he's going to talk about marine electrical basics, including battery selection, energy saving tips, power generation, and designing a basic solar system and wiring and connection connections. And I guess most importantly for all of us, although he's telling us now and not, not before we've done a lot of these things, he's going to be talking about the do's and don'ts of what we should be doing with electrical uh, items on the boats. So I want to welcome Eric here. So please uh, come ahead. Oh, okay. No, it's fine. Okay. All right. So uh, can you turn off that microphone? Uh, it's off. Perfect. So if at any point I get too loud and your ears are ringing, let me know. If at any point I'm not loud enough and you guys can't hear me properly, also let me know. Uh, so Park did a pretty good introduction. Uh, basically, I started sailing. I was around the age of 12 on my father's uh, sailboat. It's not the actual boat, but it's one I could find online. Um, so that was a non such journey, lots of fun, but completely different boat. Um, it is what they call a cat boat. So there's a one big sail, so different than a sloop. Um, in my younger adult years, I used to think that sailing was very expensive. You know, you have to be rich or you have to be old or all, the, all those ideas. Sometimes we, we tend to have that are wrong. Uh, and eventually I realized that's not the case. So that is not a great picture, but that is the actual boat I had. I had a Tenzer 7.5 which I had here for about four or five years. Uh, then corporate world um, called me out to work offshore. So it basically sat in the yard doing nothing. And it sat at my place doing nothing. But eventually I acquired a uh, Ontario 32, a boat which I absolutely, absolutely love. And a boat whose <clears throat> electrical system was absolutely messed up. The bigger the boat, the bigger the problems usually. And that was certainly the case right there. I won't give you the, the, the list of the problems. Basically, it's a miracle it didn't catch fire or blow up. I ended up replacing basically everything, AC, DC systems. Uh, in the process, so I st I'd studied as a computer and electronics technician, so that gave me some of the basis I needed. I was far from proficient, but had done a little bit of things on the Tanzer, 
Then for this one, I really started to dig in deeper and really educate myself. So from looking at it and doing it, I built a certain level of expertise. And eventually, others were like, wow, I see what you've done. I'd love if you could do that for me. Uh, so that's what got me started in the business. And eventually, I thought, well, if I'm going to do the work, maybe I should try to get some kind of certification, one, to confirm what I know, and also to better understand what is the right way to do things. Because a lot of the work that I ended up doing on my boat was not necessarily perfect. Um, so that would be in 2021 where I went to get the certification to make sure that I do things that not just that work, but that are done the right way according to industry standards. Um, right there. So the topics. So basic concepts. So basically amperage, voltage, wattage. For any of you guys that got basics in, in electronics, you'll be like, ah, of course everybody knows that but I wanted to make sure to cover for everybody so it's easy to follow because those things have to be absolutely mastered to be able to do proper electrical work and especially when it comes to solar panels and their selection. Battery selection. Uh, how to get 120 volts away from the dock or in this case even at the dock because we don't have power at the dock. Some quick energy saving tips. Power generation because there's a few different ways to get power on our boat. How to design a basic solar system and when it comes to wiring and connectors some do's and don'ts and also uh, fuses spe specifically on the batteries themselves something that most of our boats don't have because that was not part of the standards when our boats were built uh, now the standards have evolved and we want to have a higher level of, of safety based on decades of learning so basic concepts so our boats all of our boats, without exceptions, they're going to have DC systems. Those DC systems are going to run on 12 volts. Some boats, and I don't believe there's probably any of them here, some boats could also have a 24-volt system instead of 12 volts or 36 volts, but very likely there's not a single one in the whole river that has something other than 12 volts. Now, some will also have 120-volt systems. Some might, some might not. And very likely, a lot of them might have some kind of mix of a hot mess of AC systems, which are probably better left unused. Uh, now, people that will have electrical propulsion will have two DC systems. They're going to have the basic house system being 12 volts, and they're going to have another system with a different set of batteries for their propulsion, which usually is 48 volts. And again, you would know if you had it. So basically, we all have 12 volts. Some of us have 120 volt systems. Uh, quick note here. The cool thing with 12 volts, super easy to get USB. All you got to do is get one of those little things, connect the positive to the positive, the negative to the negative to your existing system, and off you go, you got USB. So very, very easy to do. Also, when it comes to 120 volts, very likely you want to use GFCI outlets. Uh, the standards mention that these are required in wet environments. I would consider my boat wet in general, so I think it's good practice to just put GFCIs everywhere. They're about 20 bucks. Same stuff as you would, actually, I buy mine at a hardware store. There's nothing marine about them. You can find marine ones. They'll probably cost you $60 instead of 20, but you're buying the exact same product. Sometimes there's differences, sometimes there are not. GFCIs, they're just GFCIs. So that's for voltage. Now, amperage. So that describes the intensity of the current. Basically, how much current is going through the wire. So for example there, so if we have a light drawing 2 amps, well, it's drawing double that of a light that would be drawing 1 amp. Uh, when we're discussing the amounts of energy available, we usually use the term amp power because amps, in terms of capacity, don't really tell us anything. Because if there's one amp going through, well, there's one amp going through the wire right now, but it could have been two, two seconds ago, could be five in a minute. So we'll use the term amp powers, which allows us to define quantity. So first example, so a battery that is that has 100 amp hours, very likely most of, not the banks, but the batteries themselves for a house bank are probably gonna be around 
in most cases, 100 amp hours. So in theory, and we'll see that's not true at all in practice, but in theory, that battery would be able to provide 100 amps for one hour. That's what they mean by amp hours, or 50 amps for two hours, so on and so forth. That allows us to quantify in terms of quantity. Um, a light that's drawing one amp, well, it's going to draw one amp hour per hour. It's pretty simple, right? So if, so our first group exercise, so if we have a vessel that has an anchor light that draws one amp, captain turns it on at 10 p.m. and off at 8 a.m., so that's a runtime of 10 hours. So if we're using one amp, for 10 hours, I'm asking you guys, how many amp hours have we used? 10, we've used 10 amp hours. So it adds up quickly. Uh, potentially, yeah, depending on the type. And we'll get, when we get into the power savings, LED versus incandescent, you wanna get rid of all the incandescent bulbs on your boat pronto. You want to have LED everything before you look at anything else when it comes to power I mean, A lot of people are going to be thinking, I want to add more batteries. No, 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 no. Get rid of your incandescent light bulbs and, and then we'll talk, uh, which is a very easy fix and very quick fix. Uh, but we'll, we'll talk about it in more detail. But potentially, yeah, that, that could be a realistic number. Um, so wattage. So we've talked volts. We've talked amps now we're going to talk watts and the reason this one is important is because solar panels are rated in watts every time but we've probably all looked at solar panels right they're never going to say well if you look at the, all the details you'll see the voltage and the amperage and all that but when you look at the solar panel you'll see 50 60 100 200 300 so on and so forth and that's what's really important much more so than the voltage and the amperage, which we'll only look later on to make sure we have the right controller, which we'll get to. Uh, so basically, equals watts. Volts times amperage equals watts. And we can transform volts into amps and amps into volts. What we can do is create electricity out of thin air. So for example, a shore charger is going to transform 120 volts into 12 volts. It's not going to use many amps because it's scaling it down. So you'll have a very high amperage on the DC side, on the 12 volt side, but a very, very low amperage on the AC side. An inverter, an inverter is, inverters are interesting, and we'll talk briefly about them later, but what they do is they take 12 volts, basically your batteries. They take the energy from your batteries, which is 12 volts DC, transforms it into 120 volt AC. And the process though, is gonna use a lot, and I mean a lot of amps. So, uh, do we do the example? Well, I should keep the example for later. Um, so if a 12 volt device has a power rating of 120 watts, what is the amperage? So let's take a look at that. So actually, do we have, do I even maybe have a volunteer who wants to sacrifice themselves to the gods of the whiteboard? So basically, I want to volunteer first. Dan, you'll be made to suffer. Come on, guys. You're letting a guy that has a plate, like, be the volunteer. I feel bad for you. I feel like I'm interrupting someone's lunch uh, or, I guess, dinner at this time. So basically, it's just a quick exercise there. We'll just do it on the board. That'd be nice to get a volunteer. Oh, you want me to get up? Oh, yeah. So ideally, someone that doesn't have a plate. All right. A brave man. Someone has to do it. So basically, we're going to be doing maths. 
And you'll see why it's going to come in handy later. And we'll be doing a bit more math when it comes to solar panels specifically. Um, so if a DC device has a power rating of 120 watts, what is the amperage rating? So 12 volts DC, let's start with what we know. We know the watts are on 20, perfect. What else do we know? We know it's 12 volts. Yeah, so what are the amps? 10 amps. Some devices, they're gonna list the amps, some won't. With this wonderful formula, you'll be able to know exactly how many amps it pulls. If you see a light, like in this example there, uh, actually, that would not be a light, but let's say a lot of lights will be around 12 watts. It's not going to tell you how many amps, but you know it's one because you can do math. And that's going to come in handy when we look at solar panels because solar panels might have various voltages, might have various amperages, but it's going to tell you what the wattage is, and that's going to allow you to do a whole lot of interesting calculations. So if said device, we know it's using 10 amps. If said device is run for two hours, how many amp hours have been drawn from the batteries? So we have something using 10 amps, so 10 amps per hour, running for two hours. What have we pulled from our battery bank? 20 amp hours. Thank you so much. You did great, and you survived. Um, now, next item, so wattage, does it seem clear for everybody? So basically, volts times amps equals watts. Um, we'll talk about it in more detail when we look at inverters, but basically, if you have, let's say, uh, a kettle, electric kettle to boil water, and you decide to use it to your inverter, basically it needs to take 12 volts, turn it into 120, it's going to need 10 times more power, which means that this number, because this one is lower, this one is going to need to go very, very, very high, and it's going to be real, real hard on your battery bank. Now, series versus parallel, uh, that's going to come in handy when we look at designing battery banks, or even just wiring them, and again, solar systems, because very often in solar systems, you might have more than one panel connected to a controller. If you have just one panel, well, that's easy. Same if you have just one battery, but a lot of, the, a lot of our battery banks might have multiple batteries. There might be two, there might be three, there might be four, there might be God knows how many. So these can be wired in either what we call a series or parallel, sometimes both, but we won't even talk about that. So series connection, we connect the positive to the ground, the ground to the positive. Basically piggybacking each other. And what we do doing that, we add up the voltage. The amps remain the same. So we're adding power, but the way we're doing it is true voltage. So in the first example there of the series connection, knowing we have two batteries that are wired up in series, and then in series connection, we add voltage. What kind of battery bank is that? How many volts? 24, 24 volts. Is that good? Not for us. <laughs> and what is the capacity in terms of amp hours of that bank? Same. We've added voltage. Now, the other example is parallel connections, which is if we have 12 volt batteries, that's what we're going to want to do. Positive to positive, negative to negative. You'll notice though, just from a balancing perspective, although it would work any other way, we will want to use the, basically when we tie off from it, we will want to connect to opposite sides. So basically, we want to connect here and here, because they would work just fine if we use the same sides, but it wouldn't balance it quite right, because we'd be drawing this one a little harder than charging this one a little harder with this one just kind of being dragged along. So that's just for, you know, making it extra fancy. But electrically, it would work anyway. So that bank, knowing that we add the amperage, but not the voltage, what's the voltage of that bank? 12 volts. And what's the amp, what's the amp hours? 200 amp hours. 
Uh, now, in some cases, and some of your boats will have that, some boats will have six volt batteries. Wire them in series. So some of your boats have six volt batteries and they're wired in series. Huh? Yeah, if you got, yeah, yeah, yeah. We're not going to go into that detail, but it's possible. If you have six volt batteries and you have two of them, they're only in series. If you have six volt batteries and you have four of them, they're going to be wired in series and parallel. We're not going to go into that level of detail, but yeah, basically you could have both. So series are versus parallel. So far, so good. You're probably wondering, what does that do with anything? It'll make more sense when we look at solar systems. Battery selection. There's Echo. Hi. So we got basically, we're not even talking about chemistry or anything. We're talking about use. There's two types of batteries for two different types of uses. So... Batteries are either optimized for a quick, powerful burst or for a long, steady discharge. Uh, batteries that are designed for a quick, powerful burst are going to be called starting or cranking batteries. I thought it was hilarious. I found the picture. It's going to be hard to see from there, but it actually says marine cranking battery, which is very interesting because there's no such thing. But, I mean... Interesting. Interesting. I stand corrected then. So repeat that loud. Marine cranking batteries are rated at above freezing temperatures, and automotive cranking batteries are rated below freezing temperatures. So there's an obvious difference because of the uh, the, the, the temperature. I, it's about an 80% difference, I think, at their threshold. Interesting. Yeah, so what was mentioned is that there would be a difference in temperature ratings, uh, which I did not know. That is the difference. So if you've got 100 or 800 cranking amps of a marine battery, it's at above 32 degrees. Mm -hmm. uh, and if it's an automotive battery, it's at, say, 20 degrees. Okay. Very interesting. I did not even know that was a thing, but thanks for correcting. Um that said, I've never seen one on a boat. <laughs> I don't know how, I've never actually never seen them in person. Marine cranking? Interesting. 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 I stand corrected on that one. Yeah. 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 I've always used the, uh, the, the automotive ones, but. Thanks for the clarification. Um, now, regarding the deep cycles, these often will be labeled as marine or RV or deep cycle. These terms are basically interchangeable. Usually when you see a something rated as marine for batteries, it's going to mean it's a deep cycle. The difference, and it's without going into detail, details of how they're built, uh, the insides, the plates and all that, are meant for a long, continuous discharge. They're not great at giving a powerful jolt, and the starting batteries are not great at doing a long discharge. Uh, trying to use starting or cranking batteries as deep cycle batteries could be a potentially very bad idea. They're not meant for that, and batteries that get mistreated might let you know in ways that are not always interesting. You could have a fire. Uh, so you'll want to make sure to use the proper batteries. You'll want to use your starting batteries for your, uh, for your, your, your engine. And you'll want to use something rated as deep cycle, marine, or RV for your house bank. Some might be labeled as dual use. Dual use batteries might not be optimized for one or the other, but they won't blow up for one or the other. <laughs> That's the good news. Um, 
I have in the past used dual use and they worked okay. Um, another note also, so starting or cranking batteries, they should be lead acid. Don't use lithium on your starting battery. Uh, not only would it be a waste of money, it's, it's a bad idea. Uh, they're really not meant for that. Lithium batteries can give you really powerful jolts, but they're not meant for that. Uh, also, they, won't, uh, they don't necessarily play very well with alternators. Uh, now, when it comes to lead acids, there's two types. You got the flooded and you got the sealed or AGM. The benefit of the sealed is that you don't need to watch the electrolyte levels. Simply put, you don't need to watch the level of water in there. Because what's going to happen as you charge them, some of it's going to boil off and you'll need to add more. Pros, whether they're flooded or sealed, they're the cheapest. Now, although that's not entirely true, but the purchase cost will be cheaper. They're easily found everywhere. Can you entire Costco, anywhere you look, you'll find them. The cons, they're super heavy. As the name implies, lead acid. We've all had to lift their batteries. It is backbreaking uh, labor. They have a higher self-discharge rate uh, than uh, lithium or even other chemistries. Uh, they require maintenance by adding distilled water. If they are flooded, sealed or AGM, they don't. But they're more expensive. AGMs, I looked around briefly, they're about twice as expensive. Um, at this point, you're probably close to the price of lithium. We'll get to why that's true, even though that doesn't look like it is. It requires a covered battery box to catch evaporating electrolyte, even if sealed. A lot of people will not use boxes for the AGM thinking, oh, they're sealed. They have vents on them, and in case of problems, they can vent. They should be put in the box, even though some... The risk of needing the box is lower, but it's not non-existent, and the standards say they should be in the box. Uh, and they got a lower usable amp hour rating so remember we said a 100 amp hour battery should give you about, you know, 100 amps for an hour? Eh, not so much. Lead acid batteries, their rated capacity is not that great. The real capacity is about 50% of that. If you drain them any lower, you'll be slowly or quite rapidly killing them. So what that means is that if you have, for your house bank, one battery, 100 amp hours, what is your usable capacity? 50 amp hours only. Lithium. Now I'm skipping over the fireflies and the carbon, this, that batteries. They're not very common. And I think they're probably going to disappear with lithium becoming more common. There are other options, but those are the most common ones. Lead acid, lithium, that's pretty much what it boils down to in most cases. Uh, they are more expensive, although I will later make the argument that they're not necessarily more expensive. Uh, but they provide a lot of benefits. These batteries are not lithium ion. Very rarely will you ever see lithium ion used in boats, and there's going to be articles about boats that blew up or had a fire due to lithium. I don't know what it is, but I think there's some people in the industry that really hate lithium, and you're going to see articles here and there about lithium batteries that led to a fire, and every single time is buried somewhere deep down in there, it's lithium ion. The batteries you're going to see on the market, they are not lithium ion. They are lithium iron phosphate. These are very safe. These have never started a boat on fire unless there's an electrical problem of some kind. But the batteries, they don't self-combust. You could stab them. You're not going to start a fire. Uh, quick note, if you guys remember the Samsung devices that used to basically turn into grenades, they were lithium ion. Lithium ion is a lot more energy dense, but it's not very stable. What we use on the boats, what you will see on the market is not as energy dense, but is very safe and very stable. So the pros, they're a lot lighter. They have very low self-discharge. I almost want to say they don't have self-discharge, but they have a tiny little bit of self-discharge, but very little. Uh, there's no maintenance required. 
they have higher usable amp hour ratings, so you can use 80% of the rated capacity. So going back to the example, if you have the lithium ion, which is more expensive, rated 100 amp hours, how many usable amp hours do you have? 80, oh, oh. Suddenly the price doesn't exactly look the way it did because one is more expensive, but they're not the same. 100 amp hours of lithium and 100 amp hours of lead acid are two completely different things. You get almost double the power out of lithium. Uh, very good, very good point. Uh, yeah. So the question was, uh, is it because we, we can't charge to the top or that we can't go lower than 20%? Uh, I would say it's a, both. You're adding something else that I hadn't brought up, which is kind of more advanced. So lithium will take a charge, like basically it's going to what we call bulk charge throughout the whole way. It's just going to go and basically take all of it. If you have lead acid, once it gets to about 85%, you have to really spoon feed it very nicely and very slowly. So they're very hard to top off. So both things apply. So your lead acid, you don't want to go below 50%. And when you charge it between 85 to 100%, it's going to be slow as molasses. Lithium, um, you can bring it down to 20%. And also it's going to go to 100%, basically full speed ahead. Yes, yes. Which ones? The lithium batteries, the older ones, about three, four years ago. Okay. They wanted to go to 80%. Interesting. Interesting. Yeah, so comment from the room is that the old ones, you could only charge them to 80%. Uh, I have to admit, I'm not very familiar with the older ones. Uh, the ones I've seen are probably from the last few years and basically get them all the way to, uh, to hundred percent. And as always, always look at the manufacturer's recommendations, but all the ones I've seen, you can take them all the way to hundred percent full, uh, full charge. Yeah. 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 So basically, so what was mentioned is bulk charge. So basically what bulk charge means, it's the maximum power that your battery can take because lead acid, you have to go into, uh, Trickle, uh, there's a term that I forget. There's trickle charge. There's basically different levels of charge. You give it a lot and you have to give it a blast, then you have to spoon feed it. Lithium, it just goes all out. If it can take 40 amps, it'll take 40 amps till it's full. So for lithium, let's say 100%, is that something that you purchase Yes, yes, yes. So if it has a higher voltage, so maybe the 80% was bringing it to one less. Yeah, and not only that, but what's happening also with your lead acid is that your charger has to give, not only does it give less voltage, but it's also giving a whole lot less amperage as you get closer to being full. Um, so th they're both things that are impacted when a lead acid. When a lithium, it just takes all of it. It'll take, I don't know, 60, 70, 80 amps, depending on what your charging source can give it. It's going to take till it's full and then stop. Yes. Uh, Uh, they don't need to be topped off. They have very, very low self-discharge, so they don't need to be topped off. That actually segues into one thing I want to mention. You can charge them in the winter if you bring them home. Do not charge them below zero. You will actually, two things can happen. If your batteries have a temperature sensor, the BMS will disconnect. If they don't have a temperature sensor, you just killed your battery. Just like that. Poof. Instant. You cannot charge lithium ion if it's below zero. Now they have some with built-in uh, built heaters now. But again, we're not gonna use that on our boats because you know if it's below zero, we're probably not boating. So what we do is we don't buy the ones with the heaters, we buy the regular ones, and we just don't charge them below zero. Do they need to be charged before the winter though so that they can charge over the winter? Or could they be brought down? And uh, you don't need to bring them down, I'm not, they shouldn't be like zero, but very likely your battery is going to be full by the time you store your boat anyway.
I was going to use it later. No, I'm just kidding. Um, these have a potentially very long battery life. Uh, they can do potentially between 2,000 to 4,000 cycles, or so they claim, but that's like 20 years used. They haven't been around for 20 years, so God knows. But technically speaking, they should last a long while. I should be a very old man by the time I have to replace my battery bank, hopefully. Um, there's no battery box required, uh, and they're not position sensitive. No venting, no uh, no box, which saves a lot of room because batteries are not that big. But once you put them in the box on the top and then this and then that, ooh, it gets pretty big. Now, you do have to protect the tops to make sure that, you know, you don't drop a wrench on them or something. You do have to make sure they're secured so they don't go flying if you, you know, you, uh, you, you, you ride your boat quite aggressively. Um, but basically, they just need to be strapped down so they don't fly, and you need to have the tops protected so nothing falls on them. But other than that, you don't need anything specific. Mount them upside down if you like. Now, the cons, they are potentially more expensive. We have a case study. We'll take a look at it. They are not drop-in. They'll advertise as drop-in lithium. No, they're not. They're not drop-in. Uh, we'll, we'll discuss further, but they're, they're not drop-in. There might be modifications required. Um, a lot of time when I do work for clients, if I do anything remotely close to the batteries, what I'll do is I'll set it up what I call lithium ready. So I'll make sure to put equipment with, which is lithium compatible, for example, the chargers. Uh, and I'll also make sure to put fuses that can handle lithium. So if ever the person decides to go with lithium, they just drop them in and that's good to go. But if you take a standard boat that doesn't have lithium and you're like, hey, I'm just going to drop in lithiums. No, you won't. No, you won't. There's a bit more uh, involved. Now, we'll do a quick case study. How are we doing for time? Probably not so great. 8.20. Okay. So we'll do a quick case study. So these are real examples. And the battery bank there is mine. Um, so two batteries I looked at. So first one, the lithium, is 170 amp hours. Now, that's the total. That's not the usable. They weigh almost 50 pounds. The usable capacity is 136. Not bad. Not bad. Cost, just shy of 1000 bucks per battery. It's a lot of money, but it could still be the cheapest option. Now, the equivalent, I went on Battery Expert and tried to find the biggest, cheapest lead acid I could find to try to give lead acid a running chance. So it is a U.S. battery branded 12 volt deep cycle, 220 amp hours. Whoa, that's a lot of power. 220 amp hours versus 170. Well, 220 is more than 170, right? But the usable is actually less. So where do you find that from? The battery, the usable. Where does it say it? It doesn't. It doesn't. If it's lead acid, divide by two. It never says it anywhere. Very good. So the question I was asked, how do you know the usable? You don't. If it's lithium, you know you got 80%. If it's lead acid, you know you got 50%. Manufacturers, unfortunately, won't, won't help you in that realm. That's something that they, they expect you to know. The weight, they're 120 pounds per battery. Youch. Usable capacity is less than the lithium. It's 110 amp hours. And the cost is 570. But these batteries are not going to be used by themselves. In that case, we're going to be building a battery bank. What we're aiming for is 400 amp hours, which is, let's call it significant. Uh, I'm a bit crazy. I like to run my air fryer on the hook. I'm not even kidding. I've done it a bunch of times. It works absolutely great. Uh, when we did the uh, solo last year over six days with no charging source whatsoever, I have solar panels. I haven't even installed them because my batteries last forever. Um, after six days of watching TV, using a fridge, everything you can think of, running the coffee machine in the morning, I had 35% left batteries. 
Um, so basically with lithium, you can do pretty much anything you want. Now, if we look at them from a bank perspective, because battery the battery doesn't necessarily tell us a whole lot. Most of the time we're going to have battery banks. If we have a big, larger boat, I should say. If we have like my old Tanzer, I had only had one battery and that was it. No starting battery. It was a crank. The house was just 100 amp hours. That's it. Now, those of us that have bigger boats, we're going to have bigger banks. So in this case, if we're shooting for uh, 400 amp hours, then keep in mind the same examples we work with a smaller bank. So our bank is going to be 147 pounds. It's about the weight of a small crew member. Not too bad. Usable capacity, 408. So we've reached our target of 400 amp hours. Cost, about $3,000. That's a lot of money. Potential cycles, 2,000, maybe, hopefully. Now, let's take a look at the equivalent from a lead acid perspective. So the equivalent from a lead acid perspective, we don't need three batteries. We need four. And they're heavy. 500 pounds of battery. That, that's not just batteries. That's ballast at this point. You have to put like two on each side to put them in the bilge or I, I don't know. And they're huge too. I didn't write down the dimensions, but they're absolutely humongous. Um, brings you to usable capacity of 440 amp hours. Oh yeah, they're, they, I, I, I looked at the specs and it was ridiculous. They, they, these things would be huge. Just to give you an idea, the, like the, the standard deep cycle we use on our boat, most of the time is around 100 amp hours. These monsters are 220. And you need four of them if you want to have that kind of comparable uh, power. How many potential cycles? Maybe 500? So in this case, to have comparable amount of power, so lithium is going to weigh 150 pounds. Lead acid is going to be 500. That's over three times the weight. I don't know about your boats, but if I put 500 pounds on one side of my boat, and the water line is going to look a little funky. The cost is barely higher on lithium, the initial cost, and the long-term cost is significantly lower. So is lithium more expensive? Depends. On the long run, it could be cheaper. Now, that's if you need or want a lot of power. If you have a rather basic boat, and you're not using a whole lot of gadgets, then a single 100 amp hour lead acid is probably enough. But someone that wants to have a lot of power, someone that wants to have all the toys, someone that's absolutely crazy and that decided they want to run their air fryer while they're on the hook, would probably benefit from at least doing the comparison to looking at lead acid. Oh, sorry, lithium compared to lead acid. Yes. So I don't want 400 amp hours, but let's say I'm aiming for 120 yeah. type thing. Yes. So I will interrupt you for a second. Usable amp hours? Usable. Okay. Yeah. Well, yeah, probably that's the usable. Cool. Would I be better if I, if I go lithium to get one like 170 and I've got one battery, if it fails, I'm sunk? Or do you want to have at least two in the house bank in case of... Uh, that's an interesting question. Uh, very likely your battery will not fail uh, randomly. It's going to die from old age or misuse. Uh, if it's lead acid, probably from being depleted below 50%, not being charged fully, uh, the electrolyte being allowed to evaporate. Those are the things that will kill uh, a lead acid. And very likely, both batteries will die around the same time. Also, on top of that, if you have two batteries and one of them is kaput, you'll want to change the other one. Because if you have one that is old, sluggish, and having a hard time, and you put a brand new one and you try to merge them together, it's not going to work all that well. You really want to make sure they're paired. Uh, so usually what happens when you have one of your batteries in your bank that not necessarily goes bad, but starts to, ha starts to struggle. 
you'll want to replace the whole thing because the other one is probably getting there. And then a brand new, super powerful one with an old tired one, it's not going to work very well. The, the older one is not going to be dragging, dragging the, uh, the, the newer, better one. Yes. Yeah. That said, uh, I would think from a lithium perspective, with the understanding of the 2000 cycles, if you were to have a defect early on or something, you probably maybe by, might be able to get away with it. But very likely your batteries will die. Although, for, well, for lithium, without going too many details, it's not impossible that you might face an electrical problem because lithium batteries, they're actually smart batteries. They have electronics in them. And it's not impossible you might have an electronic failure and not a chemical failure, which you might be able to address maybe. But they were kind of going in, okay. in weird things. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, but to your point, if you were to have two batteries, one of them dies, you might still have one left. But chances are your battery won't just kind of and, and die on you. It's just going to slowly get decrepit with, uh, with time. And the one next to it is probably going through the same process. Uh, now, 120 volts off-grid, or in this case, even at the dock, because we, we don't have shore power. Uh, how to do that is what we call an inverter. These things are freaking cool. Uh, what they do, they do basically the opposite of what a charger does. A charger takes 120 AC, gives you 12 volts DC for your battery. This does the opposite. It takes the voltage from your battery, turns it into grid voltage. Now, the thing is, is that they require very, very uh, high amperage to work. So let's say we have a 10 amp load, which is nothing. Our regular household sockets can provide us 15 amps. So if we, it's not uncommon that let's say if you have a kettle, it might be 10 amp. That's nothing, no problem. But if you wanted to use a board, well, because you have to convert it from 12 volts you need a whole lot more of it. You would need 100 amps. Now, even those of us that are not electricians know that 100 amps, that's a lot of power. There's houses whose entire panels are 100 amps. So what that means is that you need a significant battery bank for those that might be interested. Also, you need very large wires, very large fuses. It's not something that I'd recommend for the random person. If you're an advanced DIYer, you can, you can do it. If you're someone who's really curious, doesn't mind doing the research, you can do it. But it's not something you'd want to tackle on, a, on an afternoon. But that is how you can get 120 volts without, uh, without the grid. Now, energy-saving tips, which I basically could have called convert to LEDs. So while specifics can vary, so I looked around and... Uh, truth be told, I didn't even know how much power uh, uh, incandescence took because I've replaced mine. And anytime I go on a boat, I'm like, don't care, remove them. Uh, it's very cheap, very easy. You can change the whole fixture. You can change just the bulb depending on what, what suits your fancy at the moment. So from what I looked around, it's not atypical to see an incandescent bulb be around 12 watts. That's not a whole lot. When we think about the incandescent bulbs we have at home, we're going to have 40, 50, 60, 100 so small, tiny, little one, a lot of them will be around that. So that's going to pull one amp. Ah, one amp, that's nothing, right? However, it adds up. So in the example that I put there, so if we have four, here, four cabin lights, times four hours, actually, that's 16. We also have our anchor light because we don't want anybody bumping into us in the middle of the night. That's, that's not fun. So one times 10, 10. That's 26 amp hours right there. So if we have a smaller boat with a, a battery bank, a single lead acid, 100 amp hours, we have 50 usable amp hours. We've used half of our power just for four hours of cabin lights and the anchor lights so we don't get bumped into in the middle of the night. 
we haven't really done anything. Um, so the recommendation there, just put LEDs everywhere. Now, the pitfall for LEDs, they are polarity sensitive. What is polarity? Basically, our incandescent light bulb right here has a filament. There is electricity going through it. Whether the electricity comes from here to go there, it goes from here to here, it makes absolutely no difference. Electricity goes to a filament providing heat and light. Easy peasy. LEDs, they are circuits, they are diodes, meaning that the electricity must be fed from one end specifically. You're gonna have two poles, and the one for the positive of the hot has to be connected to the hot, and the one for the ground must be connected to the ground, or else it will not work. So often, you might have even heard people, I tried to put LEDs, but they didn't work. That'd be it. And it's not uncommon for a lot of our boats that you're going to have two black wires coming out. What the? And it's not uncommon also for some of the light fixtures to be wired incorrectly. I've looked at a bunch of boats with my multimeter. So actually, a lot of them factory. I was on a Mirage 25 or 26. Hadn't been messed with. And... Half of the light sockets had one polarity, the other half were the opposite, because it doesn't matter if it's an incandescent light bulb, you just have, you know, electricity going through a wire. But if it's LED, then it matters. So you might have to rewire some of your, uh, some of your lights. Uh, a good practice to get a voltmeter or to borrow a voltmeter from a friend. Now, other energy saving tips, if you have an inverter, turn it off. They draw power even on standby. So that might seem like nothing, but let's say for example, it's pulling one amp, doing nothing. That's 24 amps a day, doing nothing. That's 48 amp hours over two days, over a week. Whoo, you're in the... 250 something no 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 but almost 200 doing nothing uh so for those that have inverters very easy so this specific model i have myself you press the little button and the inverter function turns off when you need it you turn it on and when you don't need it turn it off power generation so the different ways to generate power generator most of us probably don't have generators. So the cool thing is that it gives you massive amounts of power. It's basically a portable grid. Isn't that great? Now, they're expensive. They're loud. They take a lot of space, space that we often don't have. And there's fuel cost, which keeps going up. Alternators. Our friend most of the time. So it takes advantage of the engine runtime. That's the benefit. We don't have to run anything specifically, of course, unless we do. And it's usually already installed. Now, the cons is that the engine must be running for it to work. So, you know, if we're taking advantage of, let's say there's not, the wind is not so great, well, that's perfect. If we're using it to refill our batteries. But if just going in and out of the harbor, we're not going to be charging much with just that, which means we might have to run the engine just to charge the batteries, in which case we basically have the problem of the generator again. Fuel cost, noise. Also, uh, alternators don't like lithium at all. Uh, I won't go into great details, but uh, they don't interface with lithium all that well. You can still use it to charge lithium batteries, but there's extra steps. Hence, lithiums are not necessarily drop-in. Shore charger. Well, that's great. It's quick and automatic. You just plug it in and it charges. Uh, the cons, it only works at the dock and also that the docks need shore power. So if your docks like here don't have shore power, it's not exactly an option. Solar, which is the one we're going to talk about. Yes. Yes. Yeah. Do they go well with lithium? They might. So very good question. Shore chargers, do they go well with lithium? Some of them do. Uh, most of the most of the ones on the market right now, they will. Even if you don't have lithium, buy one which is lithium compatible, because lithium is coming. Whether you have lithium batteries or not, you are likely to to have them. And also, a lot of them that are higher end or lithium compatible are user programmable. 
then that's a beautiful thing. If you have a charger which can be programmed, it doesn't matter if it's compatible or not. Just program it, whatever you want. So I would recommend anybody looking at getting a charger, get one which is lithium compatible. Because if yours is not lithium compatible, you will have to change your charger. Uh, hence, not necessarily drop in. Um, solar. So the pros, there's no sound, no smell. It's automatic. It's there. It's doing its thing. And it's the most environmentally friendly option. It's not perfect, but it is the best out there so far. Now, the cons, it's a slow charge rate. It doesn't produce a whole lot of electricity at a time. So let's say, for example, someone was trying to charge uh, uh, a bank for an electrical engine, and they're not going to go very far. They're not going to go very fast. Uh, it is impacted by weather. If it's overcast, you're going to produce a lot, and I mean a lot less power. Uh, at night, obviously, you're going to produce absolutely none. And it does require physical and electrical install. I'm an electrician, so I'm probably biased, but I find a physical install is the challenge. And again, being an electrician, I guess that makes sense. Um, they can be a bit of a pain. So we have examples there how to install solar. There's basically two types. You can have rigid frame, which are basically rigid, and you can have flexible. Those are the ones that can twist and bend and all that. Both of them need to be well supported. What you might see sometimes, though, in, in terms of failures, it's not that they're bad. They're great. But sometimes they're not installed well enough as the flexible ones. There has been a lot of stories of flexible solar panels failing because they're not mounted correctly. They need to be fully supported. If they flap in the wind, they're, they're going to die in short order. Uh, and again, we have examples there. Uh, flexible, they're great because you can mount them on the canvas, but you have to make sure that it's stable. Um, or uh, rigid, you can mount them on different types of, of, of arches or setups. Um, now, how much solar do you need? Well, this guy probably has just enough. Uh, I'm not too sure what that is, but I'm pretty sure that's some kind of electrical powered solar thing. Um, but how much do you need? And that's something everybody, how much solar do I need? And the answer I always give is, I don't know. I got no clue. Because I don't. The only person who can tell you how much solar you need is you. Because the question is, how much power do you use? It's like if you ask someone, how much money do you need? How much money do you spend? So those are that you see there, they're cheap. They're not too complicated to install. They are battery monitors. They will tell you how much you have left in your battery. So you'll be able to see I use that much per day, depending on the usage that might change. And it'll also tell you how much in real time. So you'll know exactly what you're doing, how much it's pulling. And you also know at the end of the day exactly how much you have in your battery bank, which is going to be amazing to make sure you don't run too low. You don't kill your batteries in the process, because remember, lead acid below 50%, they're not happy. And also tell you from a solar perspective how much power you need to generate. Now, pricing in terms of uh, how much they cost. So it seems to be a, around a dollar per watt for rigid panels. Flexible, they're around double that ballpark figure. They work just as well. They're just installed differently. Now, in terms of solar controllers, there's two types. You want to go with the MPPT. You don't want to go with the PWM controllers. Friends, don't let friends buy PWM controllers. I'm not going to do a pros and cons. Uh, I'm not going to go through the pros and cons. Just don't get an MPPT. My point here is to Look at the fine print. Make sure what you're buying is an MPPT controller, not a PWM. A lot of the nicer, more expensive ones will be MPPT. And they're, still not, they're not expensive. It's like $100 to $200 for a good one. That's, you know, in the boating world, it's pretty good. Now, which one? Now, boat case, I know I used the same pictures as the previous slide. I did not want to put a picture of a PWM. Uh, both of those are MPPTs. The question you have to ask yourself, you want a screen? Maybe you do, maybe you don't. Do you have size constraints? If it's that big or that big, it might make a difference to where you're going to mount it. Do you want Bluetooth connectivity? Some people do, some people don't. 
Also, electrical features, what do you need from a voltage and what do you need from an amperage perspective? That's going to be the really important one. So we have an example here. Remember we were talking about series parallel. Why is he going with that series parallel thing? Solar panels. If you have one panel to your controller, don't worry about that. You can, zoom, you can tune out everything else that's coming. But if you have two panels on the same controller, they're basically the same principles as if you had two batteries on the bank. So you can have them in series. And again, same thing, positive to negative or negative to positive, same thing. And we're adding voltage. In this case, those are two 60 watt panels, 12 volts, five amps. So if we put them in series, we're gonna have 24 volts, five amps. If we put them in parallel, we're gonna have 12 volts, 10 amps. In both cases, we still get 120 watts because we haven't created anything. We haven't lost anything. It's just a different way to go about it. Now, in terms of controllers, we'll take a look at how to match the controller to the panel, because that's a question a lot of us might have. Yes. If you could go back to the yes. Is there, yep. is there a, a benefit in like less voltage drop uh, in wiring in between par parallel or series? Or you're going to have less voltage drop if, in ser if it's in series, because you're going to benefit from a higher voltage and lower amperage. Uh, also, when it comes to shading, there can be benefits from one or the other, but I'm not going to go into too much detail on that front. Uh, but yes, sometimes what you'll want to do is increase the voltage because basically if you, when you get the high amperages, it gets pretty uh, overwhelming in terms of the wires that you would need and the voltage drop. So most of the time you might prioritize uh, increasing the voltage. So you would put them in, you would put them in series if you had controls? Potentially, but kind of a case by case. And they have to be the same size? Yes. Anytime you put batteries together, you put solar panels together, series or parallel, you want to make sure they're the same size or else one is going to be holding the other one back. But if they're, if they're not the same size, they can be in parallel. Be you'll, have, you'll have trouble still. So you can't put a 175 or one. No. Well, you could, two controllers. Okay. Yes. The, the question I had, Eric, was um, if it's rated 12 volts, as the sun is going down, does the voltage drop or is it just the current that drops? Sorry, I don't know. If I'm actually not sure. That's a very good question. I am not certain. Because I'm wondering current, if it's... Current just drops. Current? So the voltage is always... So amperage. Yeah. Huh? yeah, so what was mentioned is that it's current that's gonna drop, so amperage as the sun goes down. So you would be you would be wire them in series in order to harvest more during the later part of the day, for example, in order to keep the voltage up. They, they'll react differently to shading if they're in series or parallel. Now keep in mind shading is bad anyway. And the best way if you and the best way to mitigate shading is just to have one controller per panel. Then because what's going to happen is that if you have one panel which is shaded, it's going to impact the other panel too. Uh, as weird as that sounds, they will work together. But if you have them separate with two different controllers, then you don't have to deal with that. Now, is it really worth to have two controllers for 260 watts? Probably not. But if you have any kind of larger panels, like 200, 300, I would just go one panel, one, uh, one controller. Now, to the point about controllers, oh, yes. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, you could do that, yeah. Basically, what you want, you don't want uh, panels that are going to be shaded differently put together. Also, you want all your panels. And basically, it kind of goes back to if you have a panel which is smaller or bigger than the other, they're not going to play well together. It's not so much they have to look the same. They have to receive the same kind of charge and then put out the same voltage and the same amperage or else it doesn't, it doesn't play well. Um, so, yes, that would be a good example. If you were to... To, to have it in one way that you know one side is shaded or the other side is shaded, then you're, you'll be in a good position. Now, to wrap up solar panels, the example there, because it's very important to kind of understand how power gets transformed and added and all that when it comes to selecting a solar controller. 
So, and the solar controllers, they will tell you what they can and can't do. In this case, it's written right on it. I love this one because it's very visual. So PV, that's our solar array. How much voltage can it handle? 100. How much amperage can it handle? 30 amp. So basically, the highest input it can have is going to be 3,000 watts. Wow. Yeah, but it can't do that. It looks like it can, but it can't. Can't. Because you also got your battery side. Keep in mind, when I was mentioning, you can transform volt into amps, amps into volts, and blah, blah, blah. But what you cannot do is create power out of thin air. So on your battery side, if we have a 12-volt battery, what is, or actually, regardless of the 12-volt battery, what is the amount, the maximum amount of current it can output? 30 amps. And if we have a 12-volt battery bank, then that is 12 times 30. Whoa, that's a bit of different numbers. So that's why you have to look at both. But what you have is 24 volts, you have... Exactly, yeah. If you have a 24 volt battery bank, then you can pump 720 watts into that battery bank. Why? Because the wires, the circuitry and all that can only handle 30 amps. So it's only going to do 30 amps because that's all it can handle. It could take on the input. Uh, again, the whole thing can handle 30 amps. It doesn't really care about voltage all that much. Because what's going to generate heat and la 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 la, it's all the amperage, it's the current. So it can take up to 100 volts, but the fact that it can take it on the input doesn't mean it'll be able to provide it to your battery. So you have to look at both. So in that case, the maximum panel this could handle would be 360 watts or panels with an S, provided you are within. 100 volts and 30 amps. Um, but that is that one perfectly understood by everybody because that's a huge item right there. That's basically how to build a solar array right there. Yeah, so on the battery side, I'm, I'm a little confused because I don't, I don't know what wattage, I, I know amp hours and batteries, but wattage. So no. the, that 360 watts, Maximum for the battery, what does that mean? Yeah, so basically, that's a very, very good question. So this can take a whole lot of voltage. It can take a whole lot of things. And you have basically two different circuits. You have your circuit from your panel to your controller, and then you have your circuit from your controller to your batteries. Your circuit from your controller to your battery is going to be 12 volts. Your panel, if it's a larger panel, is probably not 12 volts. It's probably 20-something, 30-something, maybe more. And if you have two panels that are in the 30-something, well, you're in the 70-something now. But that, that controller's got to change it, right? Exactly. What it's going to do is that it's going to change it, and in the process, let's say, for example, that you're, uh, you're, you're giving it 72 volts, um, or actually, let's make it simple. 48 volts, 10 amp. It is within the realm of this, right? 48 volts, 10, we're good. However, 48 volts at 10 amps, how many, if we scale it down to 12 volts, our amperage is going to go times four, right? Because the wattage has to say the same. We're not creating, we're not losing anything, we're just transforming. So in that case, that array would be too much for that controller. Because what you want to do is you want to check to see what's the maximum and then make sure that whichever product you buy or whichever way you connect it respects that. So you had the other one there before, the F-diver? Sorry, the, which one? The other 
controller that you have to picture and has a screen. Yes. And it tells you it tells you what is coming in. Yes. The voltage and the amperage amperage that's coming in. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's going to tell you everything you need to know. And then how much is coming in? How much is giving to your batteries? And blah the blah batteries, blah. Batteries because you got a twelve volt system. The controller figures out you got a twelve volt system. It cannot give you more than twelve volt. The whole system is a is a potential. So you have 12 volts between the plus and the minus on the wires that yeah, are yeah. coming in to the, to the control. Yes. You, it's coming from your battery on the 12 volts. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So when you plug it to the controller, the controller knows it's a 12 volt system. Yes, and yes. And it converts, but the screen tells you that sometimes in full sun, you, yeah. you're at 18 volts, even though they're supposed to. There's so many watts, right? And they, yeah. that's the beauty of the MPPT. It yeah. decides what kind of amperage. Yeah, yeah exactly. And that's, a very, that's something I hadn't mentioned so far, but that's yeah. the key item. And you just mentioned it. An MPPT solar controller will take excess voltage and transform it into amperage. Yeah. A PWM is going to take it and just shut it. disappeared. Ta-da! Uh, so if you have a PWM and you have a 48-volt array, uh, you just lost 30, you just lost three quarters of your power. I think a key is for guys, I am an electrical engineer, and just to clarify, I usually yeah. design solar systems for houses. So in a very simple concept, if you remember this, the solar panels are dumb. They don't decide voltage or current, no. they don't decide anything. They just convert sunlight into energy. Yeah. The, the MPPTs you talked about, they're very smart. They change their load characteristics, as you mentioned, to, to determine what the, uh, the what uh, for a given power coming out of a solar panel, what is the amperage and voltage? And the ranges that you mentioned mm -hmm. that are spec on there, if the, if the current comes too high, it'll change its load characteristics to lower the current and increase the voltage. So that's why it seems that it seems to be disparate from- oh, I mean the, the opposite. Voltage. It's gonna low, lower the voltage to change the current. You're right. You're but right. We, we all got what you were saying. Sorry about that. <laughs> uh, uh, yeah, so in, in essence, as you said, mm -hmm. You got to look at the lowest number, and that is the, the power capacity, the input, how quickly it can, it can convert power to the batteries. That is the key. But, but it can't shed power. So, so the, well, that's why the rate is. I doubt that happens very often, but unless, like you say, you over design, you have too many panels. But if it does get too much uh, power from the panels, it'll just dissipate as heat yeah. in the actual. Like, and then, 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 then the PPT burns itself. Yeah. yeah. I have a lot of questions. If it if it if it is if the voltage or current, yeah, if it provide if the panels provide power over that big stack, yeah. the high stack. Yeah, I uh, think there, yeah. It, it will it will cause some problems. But in general, I mean, it's very rarely that uh, unless you. Anyway. So I think we're running out of time, right? So I want to go to one thing real quick. So one, uh, so solar panels. So I've been in four, but we're running out of time. So we'll wrap it up. So solar panels, does everybody understand? Perfect. Now in terms of wiring, so the two things to look at your boat. So we're not going to go into great details of how to wire a boat from A to Z. That was not an initial plan anyway. Uh, but the two things to look for that might be indication of shenanigans happening, uh, make sure you don't have any household wire. That is very common on AC systems. At least half the boats with AC systems will have household wiring. This is real bad. What happens is that with the vibrations, it will break off. It's not a matter of if, but when. It will break off. Um, I had it on mine. It was broken off. It was right next to the gas tank. I have a gasoline engine. That would have been fun. And that wasn't the main shore power coming in. So um, it does say on the screen if it's green or not, right? Uh, yes. And here's the thing. Uh, yeah, well, even if it's not tinned, the older uh, wire that was used on boats was not tinned. Uh, but the big problem is not just, and we're, in, we're not in salt water. Uh, so the big problem is the fact that it's a single strand and it's not flexible and it breaks. And the easiest way, you can try to look at it, but I mean, if the wire is like 20, 30 years old, it's going to be very hard to read. It's going to be covered in gunk and muck and everything. Find a spot that's kind of loose and just give it, give it a feel. You'll literally see it. Household wire is going to be very hard. It's not going to be flexible. It's not going to have any give. Marine wire, because it's uh, multi-strand, it's going to remain soft. 
you're just by feeling it, you will know. So look at a connection. Yeah, you could look at a connection too. Also, barrettes. Any place you see marats, you know that you might have something funky going on. You had someone that did some level of work that is not up to standards. Um, so if you see those two things, yeah. Um, anytime, so we don't have shore power here, so it might not apply so much. But if you wanted to get an inverter or wanted to connect to shore power, or even just in, in the yard, you wanted to connect the boat, um, I would watch out for those two things. Or have some kind of a, a, a charger and they plug into the service company. Yeah. So they're all, yeah. Half of them are subject to it. Yeah, yeah. Uh, and I've seen a lot of boats, like uh, the DC side, I haven't seen too often too many scary things. But on the AC side, the 120 volt side, I, I've, I've seen things that are just hard to believe. Uh, there's a boat I worked on recently. The uh, main breaker was a light switch. <laughs> Yeah, literal light switch just hanging in the bilge. 30 amps. It was also a gasoline engine. And the greatest thing is those things are not ignition protected. They will spark when you turn them on and off. So a lot, a lot of boats are basically flying bombs. Um, any, so that's pretty much it for what we wanted to cover. Another thing... Last but not least, a lot of your boats don't have fuses directly at the battery. It is a good idea to add a fuse directly on the battery. Uh, I can show you what it looks like. It basically looks like this. It is made by Blue Sea. I don't mind shilling for them. They are the one, I wouldn't say the one and only, but they're the main company making electrical, uh, marine electrical products. Uh, very easy to install. You basically put it on the battery post and you put your lug on top of it. They're not expensive. Uh, you'll buy the fuse holder, which is the bottom part. The fuse is the part right here. Put down your battery post, put your lug there, and off you go. Um, lithium will require a class T fuse, which is bigger, more expensive, this and that. So, sorry, just going back to the fuse. Yes. Because I'm really not that familiar. Um, so the input would be going... Yeah, you put it on your positive post. So you have your battery, you're just going to have a positive post and a negative post. Yep. Put that in a positive post. So, 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 so that's going to be the load. Yes. But the charge would come to the post as well, right? Yeah, yeah everything. So basically, you're going to have one of your posts, which is going to have maybe one or multiple uh, connectors going to it, like your, your, your battery stud. Right. Just put it right on there and then put all your connectors so right on that. Actually, this one goes straight on the battery. That's what's beautiful about those. Those are drop in. You literally put it on the, you basically, so you have your battery and on your battery, you have two posts. You have your ground, you have your positive. Remove your positive, put this thing on top, put your lugs that were on the battery positive on this thing, screw it down, done. And on the other side, you put your shunt and then you're done. Uh, yeah, if you, if you have a, if you, and if you're installing a voltmeter. Yeah. 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 Well. Yeah. Yeah. If you're installing a battery monitor, yes. which is a good idea, but in terms of getting, uh, putting protection for, uh, uh, for overcurrent, just drop on the battery. That's it. Any kind of fusing. Yeah. Breakers. Are those various amperages or? Just... Yeah, they are available in various amperages. Basically, uh, Anything is better than nothing. Yeah, it should be sized to the wire side and to your panel. Um, I would say ballpark, depending on the type of panel, or, or it's you probably wouldn't go wrong going with either 50 or 100. And again, I haven't seen your boat, but here's the thing if you put 100 and really you should have put a 50, well, that's already much better than the nothing that was there. <laughs> So I would say in most cases, probably going to be 50 or 100, but that depends on your panel and the size of the wire that's feeding it. But even if you get it wrong, better than nothing. Uh, that is for house batteries. Starting batteries, they're not required to have a fuse on them. I'd still recommend putting one. Uh, it's just when it comes to the starting battery, you want to oversize it as much as possible. If you think you need 50 amps to start your engine, put a 150 because you don't want to turn the key and it not work, and then you're running around for a fuse. When you turn that key, you want the engine to start. Even if it overheats, even if you got into all kinds of trouble, you want that engine to start. But, but that's 
that's only a start. That's a, that's an intermittent. Uh, normally, exactly. Switch though, so yeah, it's yeah. The, the chances of someone holding their starter long enough to to to, to start a fire is much much less than it would be very low. Unattended. Yes. Yeah. And at that point, you probably really really want your engine to start anyway. <laughs> <laughs> But yeah, to your point, yeah, basically what you're trying to do is protect. No, you're not trying to protect against overcurrent. You're trying to protect against a dead short. Yeah. yeah. Okay, so the lithium, though, this, this does not apply to the lithium value. No, you need the big one, which is more expensive, which is, uh, okay. which is there. And that also goes on to... No, cables? no. It's not that simple for lithium. It's the stuff. So, yeah. So... This is the one, if you don't have lithium, it gets more complicated with lithium. Seeing there, we're already into questions and answers. Yes. Maybe I should just let you go ahead and ask the <laughs> answers. So, you know, you did, did you have any, oh. uh, any intention to talk about bonding uh, uh, and, and uh, neutral? Oh, you're, oh, but you're, that's AC stuff, right? Yeah. Yeah, no, I'm barely, I'm barely, the only, I'm barely talking about AC. Okay, yeah. That's a scary subject with lots of here. Yes. Um, and. Ground things instead of bonding. Yes, 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 absolutely. And also deals with non-marine inverters. If you guys want to get inverters, they're great. Buy a marine inverter. You're going to see a bunch of cheap inverters. They're not marine. You will have problems, and it has to do with the grounding and the neutral being bonded together and uh, i'm not going to bore you guys with the details but don't 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 buy you know there's some things that they're basically it's all the old joke there's a two dollars for a screwdriver and ten dollars for a marine screwdriver but sometimes you got to buy the marine stuff and inverters is one of those things you, your wire has to be marine and your inverter has to be marine if not it's a world of pain I had a question yeah. earlier about, uh, you said don't use murettes. Do not use murettes. So what do you use? Like what's the positive of it? Is it uh, a solder joint? Uh, solder joints actually are not, a lot of our boats are going to have solder joints. I don't want anybody to forget, oh my God, I got solder. My boat was full of solder joints. That's what they did back in the day. Right. Uh, most of our boats are not exactly made yesterday. Mine is a 77. It's not even considered old in the marine world. No, no. Um, what you want to do, you want to use crimp connectors. They look like okay. these wonderful things. If possible, ideally, sh the shrink wrap type. So basically, you put them on your wire. You're going to have a ratcheting crimper. It's not very expensive. Just give it a good crimp. Pull on it because sometimes you're going to do 12. Two of them are going to be garbage. They're going to fall apart. Do it again until it's right. And then just apply a heat gun or a barbecue lighter to it. And they'll seal around the wire to prevent moisture and water from getting in. Uh, those are the things than, you will want to use. Better than solder. Yes, yes. Solder is not uh, the pro well. The problem with solder is that when you solder the wire, it becomes single strand, and that's what we want to try to avoid. So if you get hot with a um, voltage, it could or break. Or... It could become brittle because then that cable for that part loses the flexibility that it once had from it being a multi-strand wire and you're creating a single strand wire out of it. Okay. Yeah. So that, on that topic, you mentioned the 120 volt yeah. house wire yeah. for wet environments, but your problem is with the fact that yes. single strand. So yes. Strand wire. Even if you get the ex exterior wire, uh, that, that will not be good enough because again, it's single strand. Okay. Um, so there is such a 120 volt wire? Yes. Oh, uh, well, no. Um, it's not so much as a 120 volt marine wire. The wire you're going to get, most wires are going to be rated to like probably 600 volts or something crazy. Even the household stuff, you look at it, I think it's what, 600 volts or something? Yeah. Um, so the marine wire, what it's going to be is you're going to have, it's, gonna, it's not going to be labeled 120 because it's not 120. What it's going to be labeled as is three conductor. Uh, and that's one of the differences. Your ground is going to be fully, uh, fully wrapped in plastic. So it's going to be three conductor. And for most of your circuits, is going to be uh, 14 gauge. The gauge sizes are actually the same as residential. But it's stranded. Yes. It's not yeah, it's stranded. And also, it's going to be uh, tinned. So it's going to look kind of silver or shiny, um, because, which is going to give you protection from uh, corrosion. 
So I think we have questions. Charging here. your array of values. I know that using them when you want to go to one end, which I've got four simple values. Yeah. yeah. Two in series and, and uh, we'll, Yeah. And, and there on that. Yeah. So where do I plug in the charging part of it? The same way as I plug in the usage? Yes. Yeah. Exactly. So both ends? Yep, 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 yep. Same ends are going to be doing the charging and the... Uh... Actually, you know what? That is so specific. Let's discuss it after. Is it just right. so specific? Because yeah, yeah, because you get series and parallel. <laughs> uh, but well, I, I, if you have a few minutes sure. later, we, we can discuss that and do a little drawing and all that. And probably if this is too specific, then you might be generalized. So I'm going back to yeah. Um, and I'm saying, okay, right now I need, let's say, 120 amp hours. Yeah. Buy the lithium battery, yeah. thousand bucks, put that in. Yeah. Two years down the road, I decide to buy the prior or whatever. Yeah. I, I decide to do something it. crazy. So is it add, add to it, or is it really, you no, know, you can get rid of that thousand dollars lithium battery that's early age? Well, one of the problems you might run into is very likely that model might no longer be available. Ideally, you want them matched. So basically, you want them produced at the same time with the same history. So you want to buy them together, basically. The concern I would have is that potentially you'll be adding an older one to a new one. With lithium, it shouldn't be too much of a problem because it should last nearly forever. Um, but very likely... If you want to have another one of that one you bought two years ago, probably not going to be on the market anymore. So, and that's the reason I went with a crazy battery bank is I looked at the space. I'm like, all right, it fits, it sits. And I just basically filled the spot I had with lithium. Uh, I looked at it, it's like, all right, 150 pounds. Yeah, yeah okay, that, that works. And just plopped it in there because it fit. Uh, I wanted to put two originally, but then I measured that I measured that I remeasured, like, hey, there's room for three. So I ended up with a crazy battery bank. Your charging percentage is the power. Yes. Yes. For me, it would be what can I charge? Solar. Solar. Yeah. 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 How much solar you'll need will depend on, how, on your uh, electric consumption. And here's the thing when it comes to solar, uh, usually what it, solar is cheap. It's very cheap. I don't have a lot of real estate on the boat yeah. or yeah. So if you have room, so usually what I tell people is, if you have room for solar, put it on there. Yeah. Um, so basically, let's, and don't, don't be afraid to oversize. Most people are probably going to be okay with 200 watts, although it depends on your usage profile. But let's take a look, for example, at Bimini. Let's say that's the top of a Bimini. I know I draw very poorly, but it, it is what it is. So let's say you figure, hey, I'll put two times 100 watt panels because there's probably like the back stay right here in the middle which is causing trouble and all that so you know i'll put two panels 100 watts and if i need more i'll add more all right all right cool 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 cool, cool. yeah all right perfect perfect so now i got 200 watts and then later on i'm like oh i really like to have 300 because i got this new coffee machine i'm running off the inverter and you know i or i don't know freezer or refrigerator you name it Oh, I'd really like to add one more. Well, where are you going to put it? Well, from the get-go, if you had looked at it and, oh, you know what? Those are 100 watts. But maybe I could have fit two 140s mm -hmm. from the get-go, which would have been you know, that much more expensive. So if you have the room, use it. So my feedback usually is put as much solar as you can fit. Now, I'm not saying necessarily cover the Bimini, and basically there's two spots. There's the Bimini, there's a Dodger. I'm not saying do both, but if you have room on the Bimini, use it and use all of it. If you want to add more, then use all of the Dodger. Don't put a little bit in the Bimini and then put a little bit on the, ah, fill the space. If you have the space, fill the space. It's not expensive. Yeah. Eric, there's a question that yes. came in from uh, the internet here. Um, Back to lead acid, uh, what is the use of the battery boxes themselves? The battery box, uh, basically there's two functions. It's to strap it down, number one. 
And number two, also to capture the electrolyte, because when the batteries get charged, some of the electrolyte will boil over. And basically what we want to do is we want to capture that so it doesn't go and basically mess up the wood and destroy the boat. Uh, batteries, I've seen, uh, and if you guys are curious, you can go on YouTube. Uh, there was, I'm uh, uh, I forgot the name of the channel. I think Sailing Vessel Brick House, it's called or something. I don't know. Uh, anyway, there was one episode that he had to redo his battery area, and they show exactly all the damage that had been caused by decades of basically electrolyte that had just flowed everywhere, destroyed the wood, the fiberglass, everything. It, it was an absolute, absolute mess. Well, it's acid, sulfuric acid. Yeah, because yeah, that's what it is, sulfuric acid. So you want to capture that. And the plastic of the battery boxes will be able to capture that. And often with battery boxes, you're going to see a little bit of liquid at the bottom. That's not water. <laughs> don't, that's not water. Don't taste it. Yeah, that is not. And don't put your finger in it either. That is not water. Uh, so that's why we need the battery boxes. Um, we need, it's used to secure the battery down. It also protects the posts. Um, but mostly it's to capture the electrolyte. There's another comment here, Eric, about um, the three uh, levels of charging for a lead acid battery. Yes. And it was uh, bulk charging, which is yes. uh, full power, as you yep. said, absorption. Yes. And then final float. Float. At yes. the end. Yes. And it takes a while. It, yeah. It uh, cycles them down a little bit, and down yes. a little more to get through yes. those three. So I'm it just takes, looking to uh, see if there's anything else. It takes here. forever. Oh, yeah. So. And what ends up happening is realistically, often your usable capacity ends up being less than 50 because you can't take it below 50, but it takes great lengths. You know, if you have, if you have uh, shore power, it's not too bad and you leave it plugged in. But if you're out there with solar, you're producing, I don't know, 20 amps, 30 amps, 40 amps. Let's see, you're producing a whole lot of solar. Well, your batteries are like nibbling at it. Like you got the power, but it's just not taking it. So you end up with maybe about 35 to 40 percent real usable capacity. And it's deteriorating your lead acid batteries because you're undercharging them all the time. Yes, that's a very good point because your batteries, even though, yes, they're very reluctant to get to 100 percent, but they want to be at 100 percent. They 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 have to be coaxed into it. Yeah. 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 Your batteries like to be recharged fully. Um, now, it doesn't necessarily happen that way. They like to be charged fully, but. We, we do what we can. So yes, it would be ideal if they were to be charged fully. Two weeks at a time, though, would be, let's say it takes two weeks to recharge it. Is that huge? Well, basically, you'll do what you can. Because when it comes to batteries, we're, we're just doing what we can. Uh, is it a very like large bank, or is no, it just one battery? No, it's, it's a single battery. Okay. I think it's one to one ATM. Okay. Uh, what I would do if I were you, I would just do, I would just put solar panels and just forget about the whole thing. Um, figure out how much solar you're gonna need. And while you use it, you won't necessarily be able to charge it fully because you're gonna be probably draining faster than you're adding when you get into that upper range, which is very, very slow to charge. But let's say you're using it mostly during the weekends, then during the week is gonna slowly creep up to that level. And that's one of the benefits of solar, especially if you have to run around to different ways to charge your batteries, is that if you're not actively using the boat and or drawing a lot of power, you can afford to have something that's gonna take a little longer. Uh, so my recommendation would be solar. Eric, I'm forgetting and I think the storm is continuing more or less oh, yeah. the way it was. Um, I think maybe we can cut things off at this point right now. Uh, thank you very yep. much for uh, not only all you've taught us here, but also for being part of our experiment. <laughs> and, I survived. Uh, you survived the very first time. And uh, so maybe we should pat ourselves on the back saying that we all did a fine job 
but you've actually been in the, min in the midst of everything. The guinea pig. The guinea pig. And so uh, I think we all owe you a hand uh, of appreciation. Uh, I thank, so thank you guys you for, for being here. Work. Now, in addition to that, uh, I brought a hat, which I've been showing for the last two years on the internet, saying this is the hat you're going to get. But of course, you never did, because every week I, I had the same hat. And you never, people never got it. So in any case, this time we have something a little bit different. It's hidden away in here, under your phone. Uh, this is, doesn't look like a hat, but this is a card from the club. And on the back of it, there is uh, information to allow you to get to a website. Oh, cool. And uh, on the website, there's a whole series of either t-shirts or awesome. hats. Uh, Various colors, obviously very size, various sizes for shirts and so on. And uh, it can be delivered to your home and so on. Awesome. Thank so you so much. If you'd like to uh, use that and uh, please be our guest. Thank you very much. I and will. Thank you so much. Thank you so much for everything you've done thank here Thank you tonight. guys for being here. Next. And if you guys have one-on-one -on -one or follow-up questions, I am available until we get kicked out. Well, it probably won't get kicked out for a while because the bar is still open. All right. Oh, the bar is. Oh, the bar is not still open. Oh, okay. I see. Okay. Thank you very much, gentlemen. We'll see you maybe next week uh, for uh, uh, our talk then. Thank you. And you learned me. Uh, I've learned something interesting. I didn't even know there was such thing as like a marine marine battery. Yeah, yeah. I'd never heard about it. Shitty cold.